Uh, I'm Orville Schell, uh, Dean at the Graduate School of Journalism, and I want to uh, welcome you all here to this IF Stone Endowment uh, event, uh, one of a series we do uh, very often on the subject of the media. And uh, I want to acknowledge Steve Silverstein, who is here someplace. I won't ask him to stand for making all this possible. He's truly a great friend of the university and the school, and it, uh, it, it means a, a great deal to us. <clears throat> I think there are fewer times, at least in my memory, when uh, journalism has been more under attack. Uh, it's been under attack in myriad ways, and I think uh, the notion that it deserves to exist as a watchdog, as an extra governmental uh, check and balance, is one that is in a very precarious state of balance at this point. There are many names with, which, uh, with whom you are all familiar. Uh, Stephen Glass, One Ho Lee, Jason Blair, Dan Ra Rather. These are rather iconic names which have uh, not helped uh, journalism's reputation as being credible, fair, accurate, and honest. And I think another river has fed into this, this uh, phenomenon of, of questioning the legitimacy of, the, of journalism, and, and that is the celebrity uh, fixation that we've had, the emphasis on the bottom line in journalism, the uh, way in which uh, ratings have influenced what's been put on, the blurring of entertainment and real news. And I think finally, uh, of late, we've seen also the way in which news and public relations uh, have often gotten confused, where even the government is engaging in a kind of cross between public relations and propaganda, which is very hard for people to distinguish from real news, and yet, in some very important way, corrupts people's ability to believe that what they are seeing, hearing, and reading is accurate. I think one of the most critical elements, which we'll discuss here tonight, that uh, has tended to detract from the respect with which people hold journalists and journalism is the notion of the uh, protection of sources, anonymous sources. Should journalists have the right uh, not to identify sources as a way to encourage whistleblowers? This is really the topic which we will be discussing here uh, tonight. We really have two extraordinary people to help us reflect uh, on the larger state of journalism and this question of sources and the protection which they should be accorded and which journalists should be accorded when they protect them. Judy Miller, uh, many of you uh, have read her things for a long time. She's a very aggressive, very experienced reporter. She's covered everything from banking, the Senate, national politics, foreign affairs, and especially the Middle East and nuclear proliferation. She had a stint as the Cairo bureau chief for the New York Times, uh, was the deputy Washington bureau chief and the news editor, uh, chief news editor in the Washington bureau of the Times. She uh, was a special correspondent in 1990 during the first uh, Gulf War. And more recently, of course, was covering uh, the uh, run-up to this current war and uh, with an emphasis on weapons of mass destruction. And her coverage uh, generated a great deal of somewhat belated, I might say, uh, controversy. She's written three books. God has 99 names reporting from the Middle East on the spread of Islamic fundamentalism, a very prescient book, prescient subject. One by one, uh, excuse me, one by one by one which was about the distortions of uh, the memory of the Holocaust. And then Germs, Biological Weapons, and Americans, uh, America's Secret War. Judy won the 2001 Pulitzer Prize, uh, a team effort uh, for coverage of Osama bin Laden. Lowell Bergman will be her interlocutor. Lowell is also a very skilled veteran uh, investigative reporter, the co-founder of the uh, CIR, and for 16 years uh, he was working in television uh, with 60 Minutes, 
uh, doing investigative stories, and I think many of you will be familiar with his uh, investigation of the tobacco industry, which ultimately led to his leaving 60 Minutes, and the film The Insider, where uh, Al Pacino stars Lowell, uh, one of those rare occasions when a journalist actually uh, becomes celebrated as a larger-than-life Hollywood figure. Lowell's now a, an investigative reporter for the New York Times, a correspondent, producer uh, for PBS Frontline Documentaries. He won the Public Service uh, Pulitzer Prize this past year, uh, and every other prize that journalists can win of note. Uh, it was quite a, a, a record year for uh, Lowell in terms of harvesting awards. I'm also very uh, proud to say that he teaches at the Graduate School of Journalism and runs the investigative journalism uh, program uh, at the school. So please join me in welcoming uh, Judy Miller and Lowell Good Burton. evening. Um, before we start the discussion, I thought it would be useful just to outline, in general, where we are really today and, and why we're sitting here. Uh, we're really meeting here this evening because a de facto truce that had been in a place for almost three decades, a little over three decades, between reporters and the federal courts and federal prosecutors is breaking down as we sit here. There was a time 33 years ago when the Supreme Court, for all practical purposes, removed the ability of reporters to have a confidentiality agreement with anyone who was a source when it came to a criminal proceeding, particularly a grand jury. But that decision, which also had some shades to it, didn't really take effect and affect a lot of reporters because soon after that, controversies such as Watergate and developments during the 1970s led to the Justice Department developing a policy which made it very difficult for a prosecutor in the Justice Department to subpoena a reporter, particularly in a criminal proceeding, unless there were every other means at their disposal had been exhausted. At the same time, almost all the states, 49 states, have passed laws or had decisions that shield reporters from going to jail. And we should remember, I think, those of you who are actually from the journalism school, that these privileges came about because reporters who are no longer with us, like Bill Farr in 1974, went to jail for 30 days because he refused to identify his source in a criminal trial in Los Angeles. It seems today that all of that is turning around and we're going back, if you will, back to the future. The future seems to be that right now, today, there are 20 reporters sitting with subpoenas from federal courts to re reveal their confidential sources. These are in a variety of cases. Some of them are criminal, some are civil, like the Wen Ho Lee case, where his attorney is subpoenaing reporters and demanding their sources and using the Federal Privacy Act as a way to get them to reveal who they talk to. But there's one case involving Judy Miller, who's sitting here, and Matthew Cooper of Time Magazine, who couldn't come here for family reasons today, who are facing jail, imminent threat of going to jail. Sometime, well, we'll ask Judy about this. In fact, why don't we start right there? Judy, how close are you to going to jail? <laughs> <coughs> well, uh, Lowell, you certainly do know how to get somebody's attention. <laughs> uh, I think I'm unfortunately all too close. Um, we have just about exhausted our appeals in this case. Uh, next week, my attorneys and I will be filing uh, to ask the full appellate court to review the decision of three judges in the appellate court in the District of Columbia who ruled against us. I have already been sentenced, as has my colleague Matt Cooper, to 18 months, up to 18 months in jail for refusing to discuss my sources before a grand jury. And the stay, that sentence has been stayed through the appellate court. So um, once the appellate court, the full appellate court, decides whether or not they're going to hear this, um, I'm at risk of going to jail immediately. So we're talking next couple of weeks? Next month? couple of weeks, next month. Okay. Now, I assume most people understand this, but let's review it just basically. You're going, you may go to jail <coughs> in a situation, and, and by the way, if you have any uh, questions, there are question cards, I believe, being distributed to the audience, and they'll be brought up here to the front. 
And we'll, we'll start asking those in a little while once we get through sort of the basics here with Judy. You're, you're, being, you're an imminent threat of going to jail about a story that you didn't write right. <laughs> on charges, as I understand it, that when I looked at the appellate decisions, the pages related to you and to Matt Cooper are blanked out. We don't know why. Eight pages relating to us and the reasons why the judges thought that we ought to appear before the grand jury. Who wrote the story and why do they want to talk to you about this? Bob Novak, the syndicated television columnist, wrote the story. And someone, he says two senior administration officials, told him that Valerie Plame was the, uh, was a, what he used the word covert operative for the CIA in the Weapons of Mass Destruction unit of the agency, and he asserted that she had helped get her husband, Joe Wilson, uh, the assignment to go to Niger and discover whether or not the Iraqis had been hunting for uranium there. And he subsequently, after his trip, wrote an article for my newspaper that I'm sure many people in this audience read that basically said the president had lied uh, when he said that Iraq had been hunting for uranium in Africa. Uh, Mr. Novak asserted in his column that two administration officials uh, told him that he had only gotten that job because of his wife and that what he had said uh, was questionable. It was um, basically a defense. And, and so there was, a, as I recall, there was a, an outpouring of editorials and people saying that there should be an investigation because right. someone violated the Agent Identification Act, someone out right. of the CIA. There is a 1982 law under which no one has ever been successfully prosecuted. And there's only been one prosecution under it. It basically was in honor of Philip Agee, whom you may recall disclosed the names of many uh, covert operatives overseas. And this law was written to prevent someone from doing that again. But the law is very specific, and it requires that whoever is identified really be a covert agent. One of the many questions that my lawyers and I have in this case is, was Valerie Plame really a covert agent as the law defines it? And we don't know the answer to that question because it's one of the things that is contained in those eight redacted pages. So there may not even have been a crime committed. So I would be going to jail for a story I didn't write, for reasons I don't know, for something that may not actually even be a crime. So it's, it's uh, become kind of Kafkaesque, this, uh, this entire affair. I know many people have said this, Michael Kinsley and, and some, some commentators, and said, why should you have a right to turn down a grand jury subpoena? Aren't you a citizen of the United States, and don't you want to obey the law? I am a citizen of the United States. I do want to obey the law. Uh, but the problem is, uh, there under our laws are whole categories of people who are exempt from appearing before grand juries. And these include people like doctors, lawyers who don't have to testify about what their clients tell them, uh, clergy people who don't have to reveal what their parishioners tell them, spouses who don't have to reveal what their husbands or wives tell them, and as of 1996, psychotherapists and social workers whom the courts decided really should also uh, be covered by the exemption because it's important that people feel they should be able to get help if they need help. What the paper and I are arguing and what 49 states have basically uh, ruled and agreed with us on is that journalists too have a very specific and important function in society and that is as the people who kind of live day to day the First Amendment who help bring the public news and that in order to do that we rely heavily on confidential sources, and therefore, in order to do our jobs, we have to be able to protect the people who come to us with sensitive and potentially dangerous information for them and for their careers. And 49 states have said, yes, these people should be exempt from appearing before uh, grand juries. Some of them uh, 
with in qualified situations and others like uh, the great state of New York in which I live and in the District of Columbia in which I work have decided that that ought to be an absolute protection. So we're not asking to be above the law. We're asking for the federal law to catch up with what the states have done and to provide journalists the protection I think we need in order to bring uh, the public news. In, in preparation for this evening, a couple of days ago, I, I called Robert Novak's office <laughs> and to see if he would either come to the journalism school or uh, participate in some way or talk to me. And what I got back was a statement from one of his staff saying, Mr. Novak is not commenting on this. Mm -hmm. What has happened to Bob Novak as a result of all this, and what has he done? Well, the last time I checked, he's still on television. <laughs> And he's still uh, writing and carrying on. And he has said, um, he has not said that he hopes Matt and I don't have to go to jail for something that he wrote. <laughs> but uh, we don't know what he has done. We don't know whether or not he's cooperated with the special prosecutor. At one point, he was asked whether or not he would. And he said, well, I can't reveal my sources. If I, if I did that, I'd never be able to work in this town again. And then another time when he was asked if he had testified before the grand jury and cooperated, he said, well, I obeyed the law. So we really don't know what he's done. And my lawyers would very much like to know what he's done, because obviously it affects the case that they can mount in Matt's and, and my defense. Now, other reporters <coughs> were subpoenaed before you were. Yes. What did they do? Most of them agreed to testify. Um, most of them relied, uh, we, we actually don't know specifically to what extent they tried to get the permission of the person whom they were asked to testify about, but what happened when this case began is that President Bush was under a lot of pressure to show that he wasn't covering up the identity of someone who, on his staff who might have leaked uh, the name of Valerie Plain deliberately to punish her husband. And so he m asked everyone on his staff to sign a confidentiality waiver. And that is that they, if they had ever met with me or any journalist, anything they might have told us would no longer be regarded as confidential. In other words, George Bush was trying to waive the right of confidentiality that I had given to my sources. And I took the position, unlike many of my colleagues, that those waivers were not voluntary. That if your boss comes to you and says, hi, you like your job? Here's the condition for keeping it. Sign right here. That that's not a voluntary waiver of confidentiality. And that didn't uh, enable me to testify before a grand jury. That my pledge to the person was actually more important than such waivers. And I think that these waivers are really pernicious in that it's yet another way in which the government is trying to make sure that the only people we talk to are the authorized spokesmen who are cleared to speak to journalists. And if that's the kind of news that people want, uh, you know, that's, that's what they're going to get if we're not free to talk to those who do not have permission to talk to us. So you didn't write a story. Why do they yeah. want to talk to you? I'm afraid I can't comment on that. <laughs> it um, involves uh, conversations between my lawyer and the special prosecutor. Um, and it also affects grand jury testimony. And I'm, I'm not permitted to say at, at, the, at the moment. Uh, but it's yet another thing that we're not really <coughs> sure of. Um, we know what he has told us. But we're not certain why he believes that Matt Cooper and I are so indispensable to his case. So you haven't seen, or your attorneys haven't seen, what's on these blank pages? No. And in fact, one thing that my lawyer said when we were arguing before the appellate court, I mean, if this didn't involve me, I would find this process really riveting and very interesting. But uh, one of the, the arguments that Floyd Abrams made, uh, who is my, our, a great First Amendment lawyer, and I'm privileged to have him as, as counsel, one of the arguments he made was that, look, OK, you won't tell Judy Miller and Matt Cooper why you need them and why they're so indispensable. But surely you can show us, as officers of the court, the information so that we can 
better prepare their defense. And basically, the special prosecutor said no, and the judges have sided with the special prosecutor. So it's yet another thing that we don't know in this uh, case, which is very frustrating and a little bewildering. And I know I listened to the authors of the Agent Identification Act and uh, commenting, and they said they weren't sure a law has been broken. Here. That's right, because the definition of who is a covert agent is very specific. And it says that the person had to have been overseas, acting undercover in the past five years. Well, we know that Valerie Plame was working out of Langley in, uh, at the CIA for the past, I think, 10 years. So does she qualify? Uh, the woman who helped write the statute, Victoria Tunsing, who is a Republican and very conservative, says she doesn't think a law has even been broken because she's not sure that Ms. Plame meets the standard of the, uh, of the law. So the, so the situation is we're not sure a law has gotten, been broken. Right. You didn't write an article. Right. <laughs> and you don't know why they want to talk to you. Not really, no. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> um, now, the, the, your critics say that this is the wrong battle at the wrong time. Some prominent reporters mm -hmm. have said mm -hmm. this well, is really not worth fighting over. Well, I'm not quite sure why they say that. I mean, this is... It's not this a whistleblower is, case. Well, I think it may be a whistleblower case. It, it, we don't know the motivation. We don't know the identity, of the, the identity of the people who leaked her name, not to Bob Novak. I don't know who told Bob Novak who she was. And we don't know what their motivation was. I find that in this business, people leak for all kinds of different reasons that uh, you often don't know. And we really... You know, you can wait for the, quote, perfect whistleblower case. Um, I think Jeff Wigan, the story, extraordinary story that you did on the tobacco, uh, the tobacco industry, that might have been the perfect case. But, you know, you go with the case you've got. And it's not inconceivable to me, and this is purely hypothetical, that somebody was sitting around and read the Joe Wilson article in the New York Times and said, wait a minute, that's not what he told the CIA about the Iraqis' activities in Niger. Mm -hmm. and, and how did he get that job? We think that he got that job because, it, it, because of his wife. This was a nepotistic boondoggle. These people might have been outraged by that rather than on a campaign to destroy Joe Wilson. I don't know. You know I, I think at this point it's one of those facts that remains to be determined. Uh, you just, it needs more reporting. We, we don't know. And then your critics say that you, Judy Wilson, Judy Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> you, Not yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> your critics say that you and your use of confidential sources help the Bush administration mislead the American public about weapons of mass destruction. Were you manipulated yourself by confidential sources? I think I was given information by people who believed the information they were given, they were giving the president. And when the president asked, you know, what about this WMD case? Are we sure about this? And George Tenet said to him, Mr. President, it is a slam dunk. Uh, the people I talked to certainly thought that. And it wasn't only the people I talked to. It was the National Intelligence Estimate that published with high confidence the assessment that Iraq had stockpiles of biological and chemical weapons. It was the French and, and English and Israeli and virtually every foreign intelligence service in the world. I think the disagreement was over whether or not that was worth going to war over. Uh, for example, even Hans Blix, who is frequently cited as a critic, if you read his book, he says in his book, I thought there were weapons of mass destruction there. I just didn't think that going to war was the answer to that problem and that challenge. I think that's where people really divided. And people tended to confuse the two issues. But, you know, I wrote 
the best assessment that I could based on the information I had. And I think, if anything, when I think back about um, what happened during that period up to the war, we heard after the fact about certain people who had reservations about the intelligence. I wish they had come forward at the time to express those reservations. And to me, this case that I'm now involved in emphasizes the importance of getting as many people as possible to come forward with a dissenting view or allegations of wrongdoing or fraud or abuse inside their agencies, their corporations. But they didn't, at least not to me. Scott Ritter did, the former UN mm -hmm. inspector. Yes, he did. And I published uh, his, some of his criticisms at the time. But I think we've seen, once again, after the fact that Mr. Ritter uh, was the author of a, uh, he was the, the producer of a documentary that was paid for by Iraqi money from Saddam Hussein's Oil for Food program. Uh, the person who gave him that money is now under criminal investigation in this country. So you say he was incredible, whatever he was doing. I think many of his UNSCOM uh, colleagues did not find him credible. Um, you know, we quoted some people who were dissidents, but remember Scott Ritter before had been one of the major hawks who had, you know, in his previous incarnation had argued for an invasion of Iraq, and then he subsequently changed his mind. So, uh, you know, everything everything depends in part on who you choose to quote and, and how and why, but I think there was a balance. It's just at the time the overwhelming view of the intelligence community was that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And when I got to Iraq, when I was deployed there as embedded with a, the unit, unit of weapons hunters, the only reporter to, to be so, uh, I can assure you that the, the soldiers whom I was covering were absolutely persuaded that we were going to be hit with chemical weapons. And I was not permitted to go out in the field with them until I could learn how to put on my gas mask in eight seconds eight seconds because they were persuaded that we, that we were all going to be subjected to a chemical weapons attack. And there was nobody who was more surprised than the intelligence community and then the soldiers that it didn't happen. And I might say more relieved that it didn't happen. You were convinced that there were weapons of mass destruction. I was before, absolutely. And at some point you were actually on television saying that it was more than a smoking gun. What had been found? Oh, yeah. The scientist whom the unit that I was embedded with found uh, was uh, top secret at the time. And I, I fought with the Pentagon for about five days to be able to release the information. Uh, finally, they let me release it. I was very excited about the story because this seemed to be a man who could explain what had happened. He said that there had been weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There were chemical and biological weapons. He claimed to have been a, a member of the um, chemical uh, warfare effort. He said he saw days before the war began agents being destroyed. And that's what we published. And I also said that it wasn't clear that his story would be borne out and that you know it might turn out not to be the case. But at the moment, it was very exciting. So you know, the thing about journalism is we're not soothsayers. Right? We're not omniscient. You write what you know at the time. And then if that turns out to be wrong, you go back and look at you know, what went wrong and why it went wrong, and, and you try and do better. The answer to insufficient reporting is more reporting. You just keep at it. You keep at it until you get something that you feel is an approximation of the truth, and that's, that's the best we can do. The first cut of history, and I think the paper uh, did that, tried hard to do that. Do you still have confidence in the sources you were using at that time? Well, one of them turned out to be a bit of an exaggerator, um, and... Uh, but in general, the people I talked to, a lot of them were some of the same people who had told me about the danger of Al-Qaeda. A lot of them turned out to be, uh, were the same people who had cooperated in uh, our efforts to uh, warn the nation about the dangers of biological attacks on this country, which unfortunately happened. So, you know, this business of investigative reporting is if the facts go your way, you get a Pulitzer, and if they don't go your way, then you're just an idiot who never gets anything right. Well, you know, you probably were never as good as our reviews or as bad as our reviews. You just keep at it, do the best you can, and, uh, 
and, and pray that your sources are not misleading you. Uh, you do the best you can to check what they're telling you, which I always did. Never went with a single source, not once. And, uh, and, and hope, that, uh, hope that it's right. Why won't you negotiate? Let me come back to the, the predicament you're in now. Mm -hmm. Why won't you negotiate with Pat Fitzgerald? If people like Tim Russert, Walter Pincus, prominent journalists in Washington went in and talked, and their attorneys negotiated, and they worked out a deal. I just feel that in our area, which is national security and intelligence, it's so very hard to get people to talk to you. And it's getting harder by the day. Because in a post-9-11 environment, things that used to be readily available to us on the web, on, uh, in government websites, in, in government databases, they're gone. That information is gone. And the meetings that used to be open are now closed. The requests for interviews that you made routinely are now being denied. And all in the name of national security and protecting us. And uh, especially having delved as, as closely as I did into the world of biological weapons, I think I knew something about the danger of, of these weapons. And I would not deliberately give someone who might hurt this country information that would make us more vulnerable. But on the other hand, I can tell you as we sit here today that a lot of what is called sensitive classified information should not be classified. It, it is being suppressed in order to hide government mistakes, embarrassments, incompetence, and all of a sudden it's all covered under this rubric of national security. So in such a climate, Confidential sources are absolutely the life's blood of what we do. We would not have Abu, the Abu Ghraib story without confidential sources. We would not have had Watergate without confidential sources. We would not have had the disclosures of the, what went on in the tobacco industry without them. There's been a history, a 30-year history, of the importance of these people. And we must do everything now to protect them and to let them know that when they come to us, we will protect them, even if it means going to jail. So I really felt that the waiver that the individual signed, whom I was being asked to discuss, was not voluntary, and that I had an obligation and a duty to, to protect them, and that this was not about me. This was about the public's right to know. And uh, Matt Cooper, my colleague, uh, who also is now in my situation, uh, he did try and testify about someone who had signed a waiver, but he went to that individual and he got that individual to say, to tell him specifically, it's all right, I give you my blessing, go testify. And I know that only because we share the same lawyer, because otherwise that would be privileged information too. But. After he testified, the special prosecutor turned around and said, well, all that was very interesting. Now I'd like to ask you about X, Y, and Z. And Matt rapidly figured out that he was in, he came to the same conclusion that I did, that uh, there wasn't going to be an end to this and that you just had to stand on the principle that we would not discuss what confidential sources told us, even if it means going to jail. And I certainly hope it doesn't mean that. I didn't seek this fight. I do not want to go to jail. Uh, I've spent enough time away from my family and my friends in the past two years, and I, uh, it's not a, a fight I sought. On the other hand, I really feel the principle that is at stake here is so vital to what we do and so important that I don't really have a choice. But you know, I've noticed over the years, over the last 30-odd years, <laughs> especially in Washington in particular, mm -hmm. that the, the granting of confidentiality to a source is almost become automatic. That as you pick up the phone, and I know it happens today with my students, and they call Washington, and this person says, this is off the record. Yes. And before you can even say, wait a minute, wait a minute, mm -hmm. they're talking. And so you're already down the slippery slope of mm -hmm. being into that area. So isn't it somewhat out of control? I think it has got gotten a little out of control, and I think as a result, many news organizations have begun to revisit this issue. 
of when you offer confidentiality to somebody. In my newspaper, for example, uh, usually a senior editor has to know that you're doing it and approve of that. But once again, in the intelligence and national security world, in which you're not even supposed to be having this conversation with this person, you're not even supposed to be meeting them for that cup of coffee. It's, um, it's a very dangerous, uh, it's a very difficult and challenging situation. And in order to report in a world in which everything, just about everything today is classified, uh, these pledges really have to be made or we'll wind up with only the official government line uh, as, uh, as, as what purports to be the truth. And I think if anything, we've learned anything from WMD and from the other uh, things that have, we were told that have turned out not to be accurate is, you know, you really have to have to check, double check, triple check, and still be skeptical. You know, most of the questions from the audience that I have up here are, again, about WMD and, and, and about Ahmed Chalavi, mm -hmm. a mutual acquaintance. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the question is, do you have basically any misgivings? Do you think that you were manipulated and that you participated possibly inadvertently in the Bush administration's drive for war? I think I did the best possible job I could. Um, uh, reporting on what I was asked to report on, which was on an assessments of WMD capability. I wasn't covering the White House, the lead up to the war. That wasn't my job. Uh, I had my hands full trying to cover bioterrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Um, no, I really don't. And as for Ahmed Chalabi, I think, Lowell, you and I are in <laughs> a very rare position here in which we have known him for over 20 years. And I know that um, the uh, much-declared dead Ahmed Chalabi uh, has had more resurrections uh, and more political lives than his critics ever believed he was capable of. But he was the one person who never lied about his motives. He wanted to go to war. He wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And in every one of my stories, he was identified as wanting that. And if he gave us information, the reader exactly knew where it was coming from. I never used him as a blind source, not once. And by the way, uh, I think that the notion that the $40 billion US intelligence agencies, $40 billion a year, relied solely on five sources provided by Ahmed Chalabi, three of whom were WMD sources, that it was his information that led us to war is preposterous. It's just preposterous. And people who believe that don't understand the way intelligence works. Uh, How did you find out the intelligence pledges? I thought that was secret. It is. And in fact, the Federation of American Scientists is involved in a hugely interesting fight with the CIA now. One of the things that the 9-11 Commission, uh, one of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission is that the CIA and the intelligence communities ought to be more open about things like their budgets and what they're spending money on. And yet the Federation of American Scientists, with their extraordinarily useful project, the Secrecy Project, is engaged with a fight in, with the CIA over the disclosure of the agency's budget from the mid-1960s. We're not even talking about today. So, uh, you know, do I think the American people have the right to know how much we're spending on intelligence and what we're getting for it? Yes, I do. And if I got that information more solidly than we have it, I would publish it. So. Help us, because I think it's a little bit confusing. Patrick, Pat, Pat, Fitzger Patrick Fitzgerald is investigating an alleged crime related mm -hmm. to a story written by Bob Novak, mm -hmm. and now he's about to put you and Matt Cooper in jail. Right. Right. And do you have any idea <laughs> that there's any crossover, let's say, in the people that you may have spoken to and the people that Bob Novak was told this information? There is no way to know that. I mean, there's just no way to know. I don't know who Bob Novak's sources are. I would, I would say this about Novak. In the beginning, 
when people were wondering why he had disclosed her name and people were calling for an investigation of uh, the uh, outing of this uh, CIA person, uh, people got very huffy and said, we need a special prosecutor because the Bush Justice Department. The New York Times The did. New York Times did. And yet, I think one thing we've seen from special prosecutors is that they tend to become very zealous about their mission. And the normal balancing uh, of factors that comes into play in the normal Justice Department consideration of whether how far to push cases like this, um, none of that is taken into consideration. So you get uh, a Clinton, in, an investigation of Clinton, that goes on and on and on at a time when uh, real American enemies are preparing for an attack, and we're all thinking about Monica Lewinsky, Susan McDougall sent to jail for all of those months because she won't cooperate with the special prosecutor. Special prosecutors turn out to be very, very problematic, and can be. And of the 20 journalists, it's not just me, there are 20 other journalists who have subpoenas like mine across the country. Uh, many of these cases involve special prosecutors, and I, it certainly made me rethink whether or not this is a, a, uh, a healthy, a, a healthy f trend. Yes. And there's something else unusual here. Pat Fitzgerald is not just a special prosecutor, but he's also the U.S. attorney in Chicago, and he yes. subpoenaed you In separately. another case, <laughs> yes. I had two dealings with Mr. Fitzgerald, whom, by the way, I used to cover because Mr. Fitzgerald, when he was in New York, was prosecuting Al-Qaeda cases. <laughs> so in those days, I thought he was an aggressive, wonderful prosecutor uh, before he decided that he'd give up Al-Qaeda and go after Judy Miller and Matt Cooper. <laughs> and, uh, but Pat Fitzgerald decided in another case uh, that is now, dates back to 2001, he subpoenaed my home, my office, my phone records for the for a period of days in between September 11, 2001 and December 2001 in connection with another leak investigation into who had leaked me information about some impending government action against two militant Islamic charities that the government was about to shut down. And the irony of the situation was that the government uh, wasn't acting against these charities until my colleagues and I wrote about what these charities were doing in Chicago and in Texas, and wrote about the fact that they were funneling money, at least this was the suspicion and the allegation, to uh, Al-Qaeda and, al and allied groups. And uh, the, our reporting had gotten this investigation going. And so now he wanted to subpoena uh, my telephone records. I am very happy to say that just recently in the, in the uh, state of New York, Judge, uh, Judge Sweet, a federal district judge, ruled that subpoenaing my telephone records was tantamount to putting me on the witness stand or in the stand and testifying before a grand jury, and that that was not permitted in the state of New York, that I did have some protection, and moreover, that Ms. Mr. Fitzgerald had not shown that he had exhausted all of the other avenues that the government is supposed to go through and all the other steps that they're supposed to take before they come to journalists. So uh, we won that one, and Mr. Fitzgerald is um, vowing to appeal, uh, as we are in the other case, but I've seen quite a bit of him lately. <laughs> I'd be delighted to see a little less of him, <laughs> even though I and have wants, nothing personal. He appears him. to want to know a lot about who you yes. see and talk to. <laughs> that's, that's true. But where is this headed? Is it really headed, you think, for you going I, to jail? Well, I hope not. You know, I hope that the appellate court will see things our way. And uh, that they You're will. You're talking about the full appellate court. The full court. appellate court, all of the eight justices, judges of that appellate court, as opposed to the three who ruled against us. But if they don't, uh, the, the New York Times is prepared to take this case all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's not all the way anymore, it's just one more uh, level. And we're not certain that the court will take this case. But I'm very encouraged by the court's recent decision on juvenile executions. And because in that case, when the court ruled that we should no longer murder uh, people who committed crimes when they were children, uh, joining the rest of the world in this standard, the court ruled that, in fact, 
the rest of the world and the states of these, this, this country had decided that that was a form of cruel and unusual punishment, and mo a lot of states had outlawed it. Well, it's a very similar situation to the, the journalist protection argument, because 49 states except Wyoming, the vice president's state, um, have ruled that, in fact, journalists are entitled to some protection. So I was very encouraged by that decision, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this issue will be revisited. And people say, well, you know, let's not push it. Uh, let's, we've done okay so far. But you can see now that the tide is turning and that prosecutors are feeling emboldened and that they want to go after journalists and they want us to reveal our sources, I think, as a way of, of shutting down the flow of information. And it's more important than ever that we make this fight and that if uh, we lose, if we lose, that I demonstrate that I'm not above the law by being willing to go to jail for my beliefs. That's a, a very uh, proud American tradition. And uh, it's, once I, I'm not a martyr and I don't want to do this, but I, I just feel I have to. You're not above the law. No. The, the prosecutors say that, and other prosecutors have written about this, that obviously the three judges who have ruled against you have seen all the details presented to them by the special prosecutor, that he has proven and they have written to their satisfaction that he has no other choice mm -hmm. but to subpoena you and to get you to talk. So that even if you had a shield law, which does have a limit. This can't be an absolute privilege. Well, in no, in 10 of the states, the, the uh, protection is absolute. If I were in New York and this, this was at the state level, I would be protected. So the states have different standards. And I think that uh, you know, that's one of the things we have to sort out. But the, the logical idea that he's, what he's trying to do is determine who broke the law and bring them to justice. Mm -hmm. And you stand in the way. May have broken the law may have broken the law. I think we also have a, a tradition in this country of saying that the defense, the person who's defending themselves against being put in jail, has a right to see the evidence against him or her. And that's not the case for me and for Matt Cooper. So, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see what they're arguing so that we can at least mount a counter argument. I feel like a little bit like a shadow boxer here. How do you think this is going to affect the future, let's say, of your reporting? Let's mm -hmm. say you go to jail mm -hmm. and you get out. How is it going to affect your reporting? Well, I don't know. I mean, one thing is that I won't do a lot of reporting in jail. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> and I, you know, when I think about this case, I think about the effect it's already had. Once I received the subpoena and once we decided to make this public, I was pretty much out of business in a lot of areas as a reporter. I couldn't cover the intelligence community. I couldn't write about uh, Iraq WMD because you know this, that's what this case is all about, Valerie Plame and her husband. I have spent m a lot of my time writing affidavits, reviewing depositions, reviewing legal briefs, trying to find out myself what's known about the case. It's all consuming. It's another way of making sure that I'm focused on something other than my job. It has had a chilling effect. On the other hand, I think my sources now know that I am certainly going to protect them. And I would hope that if I have to go through this, uh, the people who have talked to me and to whom I pledge confidentiality will know that I will do whatever I have to do to protect them as long as they've been honest with me and have uh, talked to me about things they feel are, are wrong in government and tried to help educate the public. Has anyone talked to you? I, I remember reading a quote from another reporter saying, this hasn't had a chilling effect, it's been a blizzard. <laughs> Meaning that the, the threat that you're going to get subpoenaed, whether in your case or the Wenho Lee case or other cases, if you report information from confidential sources, has simply gotten a lot of people out of the business. I think that uh, it's another aspect of what I'm worried about. You know, I'm privileged, we are privileged to work for the New York Times, which has not only a publisher who is a former newsman himself, a news, worked uh, with me in the Washington Bureau, 
but understood instantly was what was at stake here and is willing to back me in this fight 100%, but willing to pay the exorbitant legal fees. We're lucky to work for an institution with the resources to wage this fight. I think of Vanessa Leggett, uh, who went to jail for up to six months in Houston, Texas, who was a freelance journalist who was researching a, a case and got an outrageously broad subpoena and didn't really have a lot of legal help and did the time and is still doing her job. But will other journalists want to take this risk? Isn't it better to do the story that isn't going to get you sued or subpoenaed? If you're the manager of a struggling news station or a newspaper with limited resources, are you going to cover a story that's going to strip the newspaper, your institution, of its resources, put your reporters at risk? No, you may decide not to cover that story. And that's part of the chilling effect. Simply the issuing of these subpoenas uh, is very intimidating to a lot of news organizations at a time when they're increasingly hard pressed. We all read about what's happening to news budgets in this country, the shrinking, growing demands for more news to do more with less. Um, these fights are expensive. Not all of uh, us can afford to wage them. So I'm very, very worried about the effect of this on our profession. It just seems to me like it's deja vu all over again. <laughs> yes, when we started out, that's the way it was. Well, no, the Nixon administration mm -hmm. had issued subpoenas for all kinds of reporters. Right. Uh, in, that, in those cases, however, what they were looking for were people to testify in court against members of the Black Panther Party, against people who were involved in drugs. Mm -hmm. Is that what's happening? That we've gone sort of back to the future? I, I think that is. I think, you know, news is cyclical and politics is cyclical and you see trends emerge and reemerge. And in the post-Watergate euphoria, the press kind of could do no wrong and, and uh, people valued the press and the First Amendment. And uh, now polls show that people have, as Orville uh, discussed uh, in his opening remarks, growing skepticism about the media and other institutions. So yeah, you know, we're, we're not perfect, uh, we're not saints, but try running a functioning democracy without a free press, and I don't think you'll find a very successful one. And I think one thing that's interesting to me is that I've had support, just not from people in our profession, well, but from reporters all over the world who have always looked to this country's press as an example of what they they want to do and they, what they want to be. And, and they're kind of stunned by this case. And uh, we've done some research for uh, my case. And one thing we've discovered is, is that in, in Europe, the laws are much better uh, protecting, to protect journalists. There's yep. much more protection than there is here. And so and that's one area in which we tend to lag behind. The Europeans provide more protection, for yes. so we may have to move there. <laughs> well, other than seek asylum in the People's Republic of Berkeley, I, I may have to actually uh, <laughs> seek, <laughs> seek asylum. I'm not going to seek asylum. I'm here, I'm an American, I'm an American journalist, and I'm going to fight this fight here. <laughs> ah, the sound of the, <laughs> the sound of our era, the cell phone. <laughs> I, I and by the way, you know, everybody says, how can you go to jail? How can you do, go to jail? This is terrible. I don't want to minimize going to jail, and it certainly would place an enormous strain on my, I worry more about my family or as much about my family as about me, but it's not like trying to work in countries in the world like the Iraq that I covered where I can't tell you how many journalists disappeared and people I talked to who would, were taken away and their entire family is taken away and never seen again. I mean, nobody's shooting at me. No one is putting me in jail as they are in Zimbabwe for telling the, trying to write a story about what the government's up to. Risks have to be seen in their perspective. I was in much more danger in Beirut when I was covering the Civil War and people were sniping at me or in Afghanistan in those 30-year-old helicopters uh, covering the opposition or being a guest of the Taliban or even being in Iraq. So, you know, prison is terrible, but I think the real heroes of our profession are the people 
who risk death to get the news out. And when I see what the Committee of, to Protect Journalists is coping with, the, the journalists under real pressure, I realize how lucky we are in this country to have the freedom we have, and I just don't want to take it for granted. I think you need to fight for it. You need to, to recognize that we are privileged to have the freedom we have, but that it doesn't come cheaply, and at certain times you have to be willing to defend it. Well, Judy, unless there are any more questions from the <laughs> audience, um, I want to thank you for showing up. Um, in the People's Republic of Berkeley. <laughs> um, and, and also to say that I think that, that your decision and Matt's decision are, from my perspective, critically important at, the, at this particular time. Because it seems to me that we are reliving the past. That we are at a point, people say that journalism and journalists are held in the lowest in, uh, in many years, but I don't think we were in the greatest of repute in general <laughs> by the population 35 years ago during the Vietnam War in terms of what people were publishing. And, and there was the need for people to sacrifice and to take risks in order for us to be here today and to have done, been able to do what we've been able to do for the last 35 years. And I th it may very well be necessary, I think, for journalists who have been taking for granted confidentiality, and some of your sources and mine in Washington in particular, to learn that they may have to help us at this point if they want their confidentiality maintained. I, uh, there is a bill in front of Congress that's been proposed uh, to, to give protection to journalists as, a, as has been given to them under the law in various states to do that federally. It's unlikely to pass. This in, year. Yeah, this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you get out, it'll, uh, it'll be there and make your life. Well, I'm glad to see that it's, um, it's sponsored by Republicans in both the House and the Senate with uh, Chris Dodd, uh, who was the initial uh, proposal, proposer in the Senate, and now uh, Senator Richard Lugar, who's the very influential uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has sponsored the legislation. And in the House, it's by uh, Mike Pence, who's a Republican. I don't see this as a liberal, conservative, or Republican, Democratic issue. I think it, it is dividing along some uh, odd lines, but that shield legislation, if the courts don't side with us, will be very, very important. And uh, people ask me sometimes what they can do um, if you believe that journalists should be protected and if you believe that the public has a right to know and that we need to encourage uh, confidential sources to come forward with information that you need to know. I would just urge you to write to your congressman or senator and let them know how you feel about that. And, and I have a, a, a message for some of the comments that I've seen from some well-known reporters and others about, and columnists about all of this, who seem to want to take a, to be on a higher ground. Either they don't want to be associated with a Novak-related case or a Judy Miller-related case. And all I, all I can say is that if you feel that way, that you've probably lost sight of your obligations as a professional, given that we're all practitioners of the First Amendment, and you may be next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.